Yo, yo, yo. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? It's time for me to break down my biggest narrative shifts after UFC 305. As we know, the GOAT, Lucas Tracy, he retired, man. The biggest what if in the MMA community, including all the fighters, the biggest what if in the MMA community as a whole. What if Lucas Tracy never retired? I don't think he's going to be gone for good, but he's pursuing other things, and it broke my heart. But I'm happy for him because that, that had to be a tough decision. He was gr quickly rising. I'm sure he's making good money, you know. making He was really making a living off of what he loved to do. But, hey, some of us have calling, other callings in life. So, somebody got to keep it going. Somebody got to keep it rolling. Somebody got to keep the tradition. I got us. That's going to be me. If you guys in, enjoy fights, fight companions, watch parties, parlays here and there, debating about fights, this is the channel for you. I urge you to like, comment, and subscribe. Help out the algorithm. About to break it down. I'm actually going to start from the top of the card and work my way down. So we're going to start with the main event winner, Drikus Duplessis. Drikus Duplessis, being Chris doesn't matter for him. It just doesn't matter. He defies logic. It makes no sense how this guy could put his head down and just lunge and literally run. Head down throwing strikes. And that's the way he imposes his will. He didn't really impose his will against Izzy the way he usually does in his fights. But the dude literally makes has the ugliest fighting style. Makes it work. Wins, can win a decision from it. And is always looking for a finish. The dude's durable. He's a guy that I said that once his durability goes away, he's probably going to be a bad UFC fighter. But now, right now he's as durable as ever. He gassed a little bit in that fight, but if he's gassed, you damn right you're going to be gassed too. And at that point, especially against a guy like Izzy, if Izzy's gassed and is relying on a second win, he likes his chances. I like his chances. As far as a dog fight, I don't know who could beat this guy. And I don't know who can outpoint him and out technique him either because he just throws so much at you. He has to score. Something's going to score. But for fight to make, I know. The UFC already says Strong Strickland, he's next. But if Robert Whitaker beats Hamzat, DDP agrees with me right now, even without Robert Whitaker beating Hamzat. But if Robert Whitaker beats Hamzat, the fights to make is DDP versus Robert Whitaker too. Now, if Whitaker loses, Strong Strickland go ahead and step up to the plate. In the rematch from Strong Strickland and DDP, I think DDP wins. Now, I think this one's more definitive than the second one. Because Sean Strickland's style just doesn't work against DDP. His hands are too high. I think DDP's going to wrestle him more. His hands are too high. He's relying on checking things low with his legs. Even body shots, body kicks. He's bringing the knee up, trying to check kicks to the body, not even to the legs. You know, in his, in his Philly shell, he relies so much on his Philly shell. His hands are always high to where it's just, and he stands so straight up. It's just hard to defend takedowns. So I think DDP beats him again more definitively if they fight again. Moving on to Israel Adesanya. The vision caught up with him. And a little bit of father time as well. It's not the, my question to y'all was, is he the same guy that knocked out Robert Whitaker in the first fight? Is he the same guy that ran through Paulo Costa? Is he the same guy who demolished Derek Brunson? And I think the styling on people days are gone. Um, still very good. Still one of the best middleweights on the planet. No question in my mind. I think if he fought Strickland again, I think he would get the nod over Strickland because he would realize he would have to fight differently. In that fight against DDP, we saw he wasn't really cruising. He wasn't on the back foot, just landing jabs and leg kicks, trying to outpoint him. Now, he was taking a fight to Strickland, stepping in through his shots, sitting down on his shots, going to the body, landing the uppercut. Israel looked really, really good. Really, really good. And he brought the fight more than he usually does. And... He was willing to get in a little bit of a brawl in the dog fight with DDP. It didn't go his way, but as the fight was going on, I was feeling, okay. I was leaning Izzy if it was going to go to the decision. Fight to make, I think Nazardine Amabov, right? A guy who I believe is top five. A guy who's right on the door of a title shot. It's not a bad fight for Izzy. If he beats Izzy, he's the number one contender. Robert Whitaker will probably be out of the way by then. Put him on the same card as Robert Whitaker. And if if Robert Whitaker is next after Strickland, put him on the same card as Whitaker and the champion. Does that get him? An, the title shot is different, but you never know in the UFC. I mean, DP, he lost. He lost to Oliveira. 
Then I want to say he beat Michael Chandler. Fought Gagey, got KO'd. But it only took him to beat Benoit St. Denis. Back in the title picture. You never know. You never know. So that's the fight I have to make. Nazadine and Mavov. I see a lot of people talking about Yuri Prohaska. Uh, it would be a super fun fight. Don't get me wrong. But when I say fights to make, most of the time, 90% of the time, is going to be fights to make that affect the rankings and affect title shots. Now, if Yuri does come down, beat Izzy. Okay, yeah, he is in the title shot. Title picture. But I just don't think he, that's the best thing for Yuri. I mean, Yuri's chin has been cracked at lightweight. You know, cutting 20 more pounds. I don't know how durable Yuri is because he's a guy who fights. He's like DDP. Much clean, cleaner striker than DDP, right? More dynamic on the feet. But the durability is what keeps him in fights. I mean, him against Alexander Rockage, you saw, like, if Yuri wasn't durable, he's not able to compete. So I don't think 185 is a good idea for Yuri Prohaska. I think he, wait, I think he should just wait it out. Alex isn't going to be there for long. He's going up to heavyweight before you know it, and you'll be right there again. Moving on, we got Kai Car France. I told y'all boys, I picked Kai Car France to win. He was underrated due to recency bias. Laser close matchup with Brandon Moreno. Then he got caught with a body kick, liver kick, shut his body down. What can you do, right? Then he gets robbed against Amir Abazi, takes a year off. And people just simply forgot. I think he's the best. He proves he's the best kickboxer at 125. And he's Pantoja's biggest threat. I think he's a bigger threat than Ursaig was. Because he's harder to take down. I mean, Ursaig got taken down nine times, guys. Damn. But he's going to be harder to take down. He's going to be harder to keep down. And he's just way more dynamic on the feet. He's faster. has more movement. And he's more powerful. Even though Alex Alexandre Pantoja is a guy who is very durable, you know, but. I got Kai Car France beating Pantoja. That's his biggest threat. And the fight to make, Alexandre Pantoja, give him the title shot. Yeah, he's coming off of two losses before this fight. <coughs> but the way he just beat Steve Ursig, a guy who felt he was the, who people felt was the uncrowned champion. I don't agree with that. I think Alexandre Pantoja won. Very close fight. I rewatched it. I think Alexandre Pantoja won. But Give him the fight, man. Give him the fight. Give him the fight in December. Give him the fight in December. Make it happen. Come main event. Now we're going to move on to Steve Astro Boy Ursig. The biggest what if, right? I see a lot of people saying he's done. He can, he can never recover from this. He's the biggest what if. He's going to be the biggest what if in the MMA community. He's, he, this is now. He's starting his Dominic Reyes arc. Relax. There's no narrative shift. I felt y'all overrated him a little bit. But his boxing is still clean. He is a good offensive grappler. Defensively, he gets taken down by people who tried, which is Alexandre Pantoja. But the biggest thing for me is something that I knew already. He needs to clean up that striking defense. That striking defense, is, it's just not okay. Right, and he finally, I said this in my breakdown, he finally is fighting somebody who has the speed and the power to make him pay for it. Keeping that head on the center line. Or no lateral movement from Steve Ursek, he's just going backwards. Chin in the air, it was easy. It was easy for Kai Car Prince to find that shot. He didn't make it hard at all. And he wasn't fast enough to counter or intercept. But fight to make, Brandon Roy Val. Brandon Roy Val is a guy who's knocking on the door of a title shot. Steve Ursig just came off a title shot, coming off of a tough loss, but like I said, people still feel like he beat Pantoja, and he still has that narrative, right, as of now. So, Brandon Royval, Steve Ursig, number one contender fight. Make it happen. If Steve wins, I don't know if he gets number one If Steve wins, you never know, man. And you'll see nowadays, we got Khalil Roundtree getting a title shot. So, if Steve beats Brandon, Brandon Royval, he's right back. He's right back there. Moving on, we got Dan the Hangman Hooker. Biggest narrative shift for Dan Hooker. Man, MMA community is crazy. They're saying um, the blonde Dubronx run is loading. He's blonde, he's tatted. Everybody's saying the Charles Oliveira run is, is loading. But I, I want everybody to relax. We go too far, man. We go too far, and then when these fighters disappoint us, we blame the fighter. But we're just simply going too far, guys. We're going too too far. He went from being underrated to overrated. We're going too far. 
okay? Quite honestly, I'm seeing a decline in Dan Hooker's skill set, not toughness. His toughness is never going to leave him. But I'm seeing a decline in his skill set. He's not as sharp on the feet anymore, you know? He's not as fast. He's not as crisp as he once was. I'm thinking back to the Dan Hooker that fought Dustin Poirier. But that heart, that grit's never going to never gonna leave him. Fight to make, I stay Michael Chandler too in December. Do the Michael Chandler rematch. It was a fight that ended really, really quick. I'm sure Dan Hooker would love to get that one back. And I'm ready to UFC to just rip the Band-Aid off. Connor's not fighting this year, if he fights at all. Connor's not fighting, and Chandler's ready to fight. So I think this is one that Chandler could get up for after seeing Dan Hooker do what he just did to Gamrot, making a name for himself, his name's in the media, and now Dan Hooker's top five. And it's a new, it's new blood in the top five that Michael Chandler has already beat, but people don't really think about that. So let's let's fight again. Let's make it happen again. A winnable fight for both men. And it's a fight that if Michael Chandler wins, he can still fight Connor. But if Michael Chandler loses, it is a little bit of a risk. If Michael Chandler loses, Connor, Connor's probably not gonna care anymore. Not that he cares that much any fucking way. Right? I see on social media, people want Oliver versus Dan Hooker. I can I can I can get up to it. I can get up to it. But um I I think I would write rather see Oliveira fight a bigger fight, a bigger name, you know, his title chances at 155, I think, are kind of passing us by, and he's getting nothing but older, and his style of fighting is, is going to get worse as he gets older, so I want to see the big names, the big, the biggest names that he could get, while I still get a few more fights out of Oliveira, like Volkanovski, that would be very, very, very tough fight for me to like watch because they're both in my top three favorite fighters right now but you know that's that's a fight that hey man let's do it let's you know stuff like that you know kind of how dp is right now big names big money so i want to see Oliver. i want to see Oliver go to 170 and fight some people you know let's make some money let's entertain some people moving on to mateus gamrot finally exposed they're telling y'all he's not that guy He's just not that guy. He's very, very skilled. Very skilled. Very fast on the feet. Good wrestling, not good control. Whenever he does get the wrestling where he wants it to be, he's not threatening submissions. He's not landing ground and pound. He's not doing anything to towards finishing the fight. So it's just empty grappling. And if he gets a striker who takes advantage of every moment he has on the feet, he's going to lose. He's going to beat Gamrot. The fight to make, for me, Rafael Fazeev too. Whenever he gets healthy again, which I can't imagine is too long from now, run it back. So I think Rafael can KO him. So run it back. Run it back, Rafael Fazeev. Moving on to Biggie Boy, Jarzinho Rosenstrike. Um, it's not much that we didn't know already, but we knew he was high IQ. He's hard to suck into a brawl, and he cares more about the win. You know, that's his number one thing. Win, collect the paycheck, move up the rankings, you know. He's not so set on KO on somebody. If it presents itself, he'll, he'll go for it. But he's not just going to gas himself out. He's not going to brawl with you. He's, he knows that his Muay Thai and his skill set, he can out-technique every single... Whoa. Whoa. Majority heavyweights on the world. In the world. So, he just uses that and he get, he collects dubs. It's, and it's Okay. To perform, we have people like that who would rather win over the excitement. You know, Mateus Gamrot's a guy who would rather win over the excitement. You know, none for Ty Tuivasa. None for Ty. I think he's okay. Sorry, I just spoiled. I think he's okay. I think he'll be fine. Um, I don't think the UFC will cut him because of his personality and the eyeballs he'll bring whenever they go to that side of the world. But um, it's time to give him a favorable matchup. Let's give him somebody that he can compete with. He can he can actually beat. You know, Ty looks good in that fight against Rose Strike. He looked good for what I was expecting. For what Jarzinho presents, he was good. He did good. Carlos Protez, none for me. None for me. I've been on him. I've been on him in my breakdown. He's baby boy time. He has he has the death touch. He's nice. He's loose. He's very comfortable. He just flows in there. He takes his time, too. Sharp, sharp shooter. Every strike intended to hurt. 
every strike is just precise on the money, and every strike sets up the next. He's nice. Fight to make Vicente Luque or Jeff Neal. Those are two bangers. I think Jeff Neal would be more fun to watch because you get that boxing, and Jeff Neal, his craftiness on the feet, that would be a nice striking matchup. Vicente Luque, I mean, eh, it's a name. You know, it's a name, and he still he still holds a little value as of now. Still holds some value. Um, I don't know how much Vicente Luque wants to fight nowadays. That's why it's like, eh. but Vicente Luque, I want to say he's ranked higher than Jeff Neal. Not saying Carlos Protest needs to be rushed to a title shot, but you know, between eight and fifteen, let's give him one of those. I think Jeff Neal though would be more fun for me. Vicente Luque is a more winnable fight for Carlos Protez, I feel. None for Lee Jingliang. Um, maybe his durability is taking a back step, but I don't think it is. I think it's just Carlos Protez has a death touch. He has, he has a death touch. He really does. None for Junior Ty for Walter Walker. Trash. Hikaru Hamos. Overrated striker and BJJ. When he had Josh Kulabao's back, no way in hell that wasn't supposed to be a finish. You know, that's not supposed to be a finish. You have the rear naked choke like this. Okay, that's not working. Why? I'm screaming at the TV. Go palm the palm. Go palm the palm. How DDP submitted Israel Adesanya. Go palm the palm and crank it. And it would have been a finish. Plus, he's a guy that I was already questioning his jujitsu because he'd been getting caught in all these guillotines. And I say guillotines don't work at the highest level. So, yeah. And overrated striking is, bro, he was severely compromised. And he was getting pieced up by Josh Coolibau. Bad. You know, bad. He, he didn't look like he belonged in there as far as striking and on the feet. Speaking of Josh Coolibau, he's untrustworthy. Horrible fight IQ. He screwed himself out of that fight. He lost that fight because of himself. And he just sucks. He's a guy that you cannot bet on. I didn't bet on him. I actually bet Ricardo um, plus three and a half. But he's a guy that you cannot bet on. In the future. Because he's untrustworthy. You can't trust him. You cannot trust him. That's not a fight. That's a fight that's not even supposed to be close. You're not supposed to lose that fight. So, could, moving on. King Casey O'Neal. I told y'all she was underrated due to recency bias. She was coming off of two L's. She got KO'd and then subbed in the same fight in her last fight. In her, in her last loss. but In her last fight. But, she's still a great young prospect. and A possible title contender. So, on the 26th, I believe. Um, she's continuing to get better and add to her game in every fight. You know, her grappling has gotten significantly better. Um, and her wrestling has gotten significantly better. Able to control positions. Um, her striking has always been there as far as volume. You know, she was never the most powerful. But her biggest thing is she just needs to stop getting hit so much. And she did not get hit that much in this fight. So, good job, King Casey O'Neal. Getting better in each fight. I'm seeing it. Seeing it, this is not the same woman who went to a split decision with Ro Roxanne. I forgot her last name, but she was 40 years old, barely 500 record. This is she's getting better in each fight, and I'm seeing it. Now onto Luana Santos, she was overrated due to recency bias. Another thing I touched on in my breakdown before the fights came out, she's unpolished, but it's she'll be fine. I think she'll be fine. She's maybe 24, 25. She'll be fine. You know, she needs to work on that boxing some more. She needs to work on that head movement some more. Um, evolve her wrestling, and not rely so much on judo. Because judo is good in, posi in positions, but it can't be used everywhere in the octagon like wrestling can. So work on that wrestling, work on that cardio, clean up the boxing, she'll be fine. I still think Luana Santos could be something in this division. She's fine. Nothing but time to improve. Jack Jenkins, nasty boxer. Dance. That motherfucker had an eight-pack. Saturday. Had an eight pack. <laughs> so I'm saying nasty boxer though. He was a guy that we were talking about savage leg kicks and power and really just get in your face. And that's what he was. But he show class he showcased some class, man. Man, the left hook to the body, then bringing it back up to the top, landing flush. I mean it was against Herbert Burns. So I can't put too much stock in it. But man, his level he's he's working all levels. Man, he looks good. He looks good. I didn't think of a fight to make for him, but he looks good. He looks good. I want to keep him outside of the rankings. Have him fight somebody that's still not ranked. Keep him outside of the rankings. You know, give him. He needs a slow build. 
No, no, it doesn't need. He doesn't really need a slow build, but I would like to see him get more of a slower build. You know, don't risk him too fast because he looks promising. You know, featherweight division. <sighs> Take his contract away. Moving on to Tom Nolan. A bit overhyped, but it's okay. He needs a slow build. It's a bit overhyped. You know, everybody was expecting him to run through Alex Reyes. So was I. And maybe that could be us just underrating Alex Reyes. But the whole 6'3", Tom Nolan, lightweight division, cut that out. Because I'm not seeing him just use that length and out and just dominate people. So... Give him a slower build. I think the fight to make with him is Tiago Moisés or Jamie Malarkey. No names outside of the rankings, winnable, favorable matchups. Keep him on that train for now, you know, because, yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep him, keep him on that train as of now. But Tom Nolan, not a guy that I'm ready to give up on by any means, but he was just a bit overhyped, just a bit overhyped. I said in my breakdown that I don't think he was that great. But I thought he was going to look it against Alex Reyes. He looked good against Alex Reyes, don't get me wrong, but he didn't look like a minus 1,200 favorite. No. No way, Jose. And Alex Reyes, man, he proved he could still bang. You know, took a round. One of the judges gave him a round. He was still in the fight. Never gave up on himself. Landed some strikes of his own. Bringing a fight to Tom Nolan. He could still bang. You know, he was a guy that I was questionable about, you know, with his health issues and things of that nature and his killer be killed mentality, but... He fought differently in this fight, and he was he was banging. He was banging, and I was impressed with Alex Reyes. So shout out to Alex Reyes, man. Shout out to Alex Reyes. Song Kanon. No killer instinct. He had Ricky Glenn KO'd, I felt, about four or five times. And Ricky Glenn was ready. You know, Ricky Glenn, Song Kanon will open the door for Ricky Glenn to go out of it and then close it. No killer instinct. And we kind of knew this after he had Ian Gary on skates and then he shot a takedown but in the third round in the third round he went to clinch and grapple against the cage after a second round he was brutalizing Ricky Glenn I don't know no killer instinct another guy that you can't really trust that much unless it's a favorable matchup I did bet him because it was a favorable matchup and he showed and you could trust him against those against people who aren't UFC level and yes Ricky Glenn not UFC level um it's time to take his contract Time for him to go back to the regionals or just give it up, you know? For real. No narrative for Jesus Aguilar. Stuart Nickel. It's not really a narrative shift on him, but like his kind. That sounds bad. But when I say his kind, I mean uh, undefeated prospects on the regionals. Record isn't everything. You look at his record, his best win is against a guy who's 1-1. One one. Everybody else 0-1, 0-2, 0-3. So, he's a guy that should have been on the Contender Series instead. And he got rushed to the UFC because he was regional, you know, and he got submitted in the first round. And now who knows where it is for him. So, but yeah, that's going to wrap this one up. Um, UFC Apex card prediction should be dropping Tuesday or Wednesday. But that was my biggest narrative. Just tell me what you agree with. Tell me what you would change. Tell me if there was some narrative that I'm missing. Tell me if there's a better fight to make. I love it all. Talk to me down in the comments. Like, comment, subscribe. Please, please help out that algorithm. Till next time, it's been your boy. You ain't got to go home. But you got to get up out of here. Yeah.